Well, sociology is the study of human societies, and that includes individuals within those societies, and that, it, you know, all the social institutions such as family, um, how we make decisions, uh, educational processes, including just the ones of socialization within your family, um, and also uh, religion and um, polity, or how we make decisions, and economics, you know, how we, how we use exchange of goods and services. And it is a different way of thinking and understanding the world, whether it's the human social world or the natural environment and our relationship with the natural environment. Um, and it gives us a kind of toolkit for um, understanding why we have the experiences we have and why we see the world and the issues the way that we see them. So. As sociologists, we're interested in people's behavior and to some extent people's behavior is outside of themselves. You know, people of course have ultimate responsibility for their lives and their behaviors and decisions, but there's a whole host of factors outside um, of the individual that can potentially play a role in that. That's what sociology tries to be attentive to. Whenever we're, we're born and we're placed into the world, there's this already existing world and structure that we're in, embedded in. Um, and people kind of bump up against that and, and attempt to bump up against that and, and kind of transgress those boundaries and, and those norms. Um, and that's something that sociology sheds light on. Sociology focuses on group interaction. So the unit of analysis is the group. Um, in contrast uh, with psychology that focuses more on the individual, um, the mind and individual behavior. Now, that's a very simplified way of making the distinctions because there are overlapping sub areas. One of them is social psychology, where sociology blends with psychology. But sociology is interested in every institution um, economics, so we have economic sociology, politics, so we have political sociology. We have social anthropology, and we have uh, the sociology of literature, even, um, because everywhere human beings engage in any social activity, um, be that even the most intimate social activity, sociology has some interest in it as, a re as research foci, but also as a way of um, um, make enhancing our general understanding of, of human interactions. We study institutions, just those big overarching structures that situate our, our lives and our, our behaviors, um, everything from the workplace to family to health. Um, and really anything that people do in the world is something that's right for sociological investigation. Um, we're, we're people science and, and we study the things that people do. Um, and we do that, we do that in, in ways distinct from other disciplines and, and other um, departments. So sociology is a really valuable toolkit. It's a way of engaging systematically with the world. We watch patterns and we look at patterns and we look at what are the factors that um, impact like life chances and those sorts of things. So, you know, we study people, we study aging, we study organizations, we study social change, um, we look at social institutions like the education system, the healthcare system, um, the criminal justice system, media, um, and we look at all of those things, how they work, how they're organized. Sometimes I think about it like, a, like an iceberg, how 90% of the mass of an iceberg is under the water and can't see it. Sociologists tend to think about society in that way as well. Um, there's certain aspects of our world that we're well aware of, but there's a whole slew of other issues that are hidden or just kind of embedded um, in, in these larger structures. And to be a good sociologist or to think like a sociologist does mean that sometimes we try to delve underwater and, and try to see that 90% that, that's hidden from the everyday world. Um, you as a member of the group, will be affected by the group in, in which uh, uh, you live. Um, if you're an American, you, you learn to talk in a 
particular way, not because you were born that way. And sociology is interested in establishing the fact that your accent, your speech patterns, your preferences, your attitudes, much of it is learned and specific to your group. So we study that scientifically. And sometimes it's difficult for us to even um, make sense of or even recognize culture because we're so blinded by it since we're embedded in culture since day one. Sometimes we refer to this as sociology of the everyday, just the stuff that normal people do, whether it's you know relationships with their pets or conversations that we have or the ways that men versus women take up space on buses or airplanes. You know, all those things seem like they're meaningless, but there's there's something important. There's something sociologically important about those minor, taken for taken for granted. Um, notions of, of our behaviors. So the goal for sociologists is to, to make the familiar unfamiliar. So you don't take for granted the assumptions. You actually might start with the assumptions and look at those critically in terms of um, how, does it, how do those assumptions shape the way that we see things. So for example, we are trained in the United States to have an individualistic orientation, right? We're taught that the United States is a meritocracy, there's a strong ethos of individualism, that people will succeed and fail based on either their work ethic or their talent or, their, or a combination of the two, right? And so that's kind of assumption that's built into the U.S. Structure, culture, um, really just basically all of our major social institutions. And so as a sociologist, we ask the question, well, is that true, right? And so you kind of flip it and don't take that assumption for granted. You actually interrogate the assumption and then go out and investigate to see if that's the case. And so then that opens up an opportunity for you to see things that you otherwise wouldn't see. So if you just focus on individuals and individual behavior, you can see how that individual behavior is connected to somebody's life chances or, or where they wind up in society. But then as a sociologist, I'm also interested in how people are situated within social groups and social institutions and how that might shape their life, their trajectories, you know, where they wind up in, in life. And so it's a different reference point and it allows us to see things that typically you wouldn't see. I think as good socialized Americans, we like to think that we're the ultimate individuals and, and culture doesn't matter and it doesn't influence us. Um, but whenever we do look at the broader scheme of, of social issues, we see that um, that it does matter. It's hard to, to deny the fact that um, that we're good conformists. You know, we're a nation of individuals, but we're also very good um, at kind of falling, falling in line and um, kind of adhering to just the norms and expectations of, of what it means to be, you know, quote, a good person or good American. You know, you fill in the blank. Um, it's difficult. I think that is probably the biggest challenge in our intro level classes to try to get students to see that both things can be happening simultaneously. You can be an individual but still be bound by culture or influenced by culture. Um, it takes a while for, for intro students to, to get there, but once they get there, um, it, really is, it really is like putting a new lens over your eyes or putting on a new set of glasses because you, you really do see the world in an entirely different light after that. Um, individualism matters, you know, the individual behaviors and psyche, those things matter, but, but culture is powerful and part of its power is that it's sometimes hidden and it's this embedded, um, unrecognized component of our day-to-day -day world. Um, sociology tries to uncover that and tries to, you know, kind of rip the curtain back so that we can see how it is that these things matter, these things influence us. They don't dictate our outcomes, but they, they are influential. We know what's happening to us. You know, my dad lost his job or, you know, um, you know, I was in a car accident and that affected me personally. But we also want students and uh, to look at the intersection of their own biographies and what's happening in their social context or their history. Because, you know, our experiences are shaped by what we're born into and the time period that we're born into. And so, yes, my dad lost his job, but 
hey, there is an economic downturn in all of society. It's not, it's not his fault necessarily. It's something that's happened at an institutional level that's part of our society's makeup. And maybe we can understand that process a little bit more and not blame the victim for what's happening to them individually at this point in time. And so I think that's one of the main uh, gifts that we give to students, even if they're not majoring in sociology, is that to look beyond their own personal experience in, in a larger social context and try to understand it in a, a, from an institutional level and how some opportunities are structured for you and some are structured against you. And it's not always your fault. It's maybe just circumstantial in terms of the time period that you're born to, into or the social class that you're born into or the, or the group that you happen to be born in, into in a geographic sense. So, you know, it, it, that, that's one of the things I think that we really strive to do with uh, our interest students in particular, but all students coming through the program is to, to understand social forces and how they affect the individual. Our cultures uh, affect often the way we explain our behaviors. Uh, in most Western industrialized capitalist cultures, we tend to attribute our behaviors to internal factors. So we, we, we make claim to being uh, smart because we worked hard. Um, in other cultures, it's a lot easier to to explain the fact that your behavior is si significantly influenced by the group to which you belong. So, uh, because I'm teaching in a Western industrialized capitalist culture, I've I've had to put in more effort to translate the fact that the, the, your behavior, or mind behavior is as much biographical as it is historic. It's historic in the sense that larger social institutions and forces intersect with my biography to f completely explain why I do what I do and how I do what I do and where I do what I do. So, for example, my um, desire to leave the campus very quickly at the end of a work day is going to be constrained by the uh, macro rules of traffic light compliance. So I would have to wait no matter how motivated I am to get to the next assignment I would have to wait for other cars that have the right of way. That's one way in which my individual behavior is constrained by um, uh, macro-social structures. Uh, but it's not just constraints, macro-social structures do facilitate our behaviors. I do have students who, who tend to want to dismiss that, but when you provide evidence okay, of this group, this proportion, you know, maybe doesn't have access to education as much as this other group. When they see the data, data speaks volumes, and if they're using a scientific mind and logic, uh, then then they understand the processes a little bit better. And, and if they're able to step back a little bit and look at it from a larger social context, I, I, you know, really the pillars of science are logic and observation and we use those in sociology too. So if you if your observations are your data then you have to use logic then to interpret that data. And sometimes people's prejudices of course get in the way but it, it makes for lively discussions and we can look at things from different points of view and see where the truth really lies. There are obviously certain people who even in the face of evidence they will, they will uh, they will stand their ground, as, as it were. Uh, but we generally say that um, you have the right to your opinion, not to your facts. And, and that's, that's how I, I, I brutally bring it to their attention. Yes, you could think one way, but let's look at what the data suggests. But I'm also honest enough to let them know that data are not always foolproof. That's why we continue the research process. In other words, data could themselves be biased. 
uh, there are all kinds of information still there. So not everything that is data is accurate fact. And so one of the challenges more for them, for their generation, than when we were going to school is sorting through the morass of, of data and, and, and separating facts from fiction. And uh, one of the areas um, we tend to discuss more is uh, poverty. Uh, most people, most, most of my students, when I ask them what they think about people on welfare, they automatically go into those stereotypes of people who are lazy, people who um, are dishonest and they want to game the system. And so you then bring forth research findings to answer those questions. For example, you let them know that over 35% of those who are on welfare are children under 15. By our laws, they should not be working. And so they couldn't be accused of being lazy. You tell, let them know that 27% of those who are on welfare are working eight-hour jobs like McDonald's, Whataburger, that will not give you $21, $22,000. That's the cutoff point for poverty in the United States. Uh, we let them know that they, well, as many of them as are here on Pell Grants, are also part of it. Six percent of those who are welfare are on Pell Grants, students like them. That brings it home, so that when they look at the when they look at the poor, henceforth, they don't have the assumption that the poor are actually lazy. The idea is that these different systems of stratification are so important in shaping people's life chances and their interactions with other social institutions, right? So if you're poor, your experience with the education system, with the criminal justice system, um, even with like religion, uh, with healthcare, are all going to be shaped by your economic location. In our culture, whenever we think about credit card debt, um, we usually frame that as an individual failing. You know, this person is making the wrong economic choices, you know, is not, you know, adhering to their budget, etc. If we were to use a sociological perspective to try to make sense of credit card debt, we could see that there's this culture of consumption that might be feeding into that. Credit cards and credit card debt is, it is more natural today. I mean, it, it is the norm for everyone age 18, come to college, and you, you just get a, a slew of these credit card applications. Get a free t-shirt if you apply for our credit card, or you know, get free shipping on Amazon, or whatever the case might be. Um, there, there's those factors, you know, they might see that their parents are increasingly relying on credit cards as well. Um, their, their peers, you know, it's becoming just a normal part of young adulthood and, and college life. Um, in that sense, it, it's normalized, um, still stigmatized, but it's a normalized component of, of our economic world. Um, so it's an individual choice. People are individually deciding, you know, I'm going to pay my power bill with my credit cards, or I'm going to buy this with my credit cards, um, or, you know, during the summer I'm going to live off my credit cards but at the same time there's something greater um, at play here. Um, that, that to me is, is, is one of the powers of sociology, is that we're able to look outside of the individual and see how there's these other things in the world, these other powers in the world that are providing opportunities for some, providing constraints for others, and situating us on particular pathways. I mean, one of the things of science is to try to make predictions about certain things. And, and we do know, for example, that, you know, feelings of prejudice are higher whenever there is more economic competition among groups. And so, you know, knowing that in any context is going to be helpful, that sometimes when people are prejudicial, you'll understand that it's not just that um, they really hate pe other people, it's just that they're feeling a pressure that's created from the outside that makes them manifest this sort of feeling and 
uh, and show it towards other groups in some way. I mean, you can predict when the KKK is going to get active because of, of those kind of social trends that happen. And that's because sociologists have sort of noticed this over, over time. So yeah, there, uh, and, and that's, that's actually what sociology has to deal with. Uh, if you're going to deal with race relations, you're going to talk about uh, the KKK, right? You're going to talk about all groups, and you're going to talk about them in a scientifically honest manner. A lot of other social sciences, you know, they're, they're very much focused on the individual and, and as they should be, um, but there's this assumption in sociology that people's behavior is influenced by things outside of them. Um, we're, we're all born into this world with identities and genders and racial, ethnic identities, and all that matters, you know, and it matters more to some people than others. Um, and it doesn't define us and it doesn't, you know, kind of prescribe us for a particular life outcome, but it does influence the pathways that we may find ourselves on. Some of the top skills that sociology majors tend to use in their careers, um, number one is using and constructing evidence-based arguments, um, being able to Number one, recognize data and also analyze those data and make sense of those data, um, write reports um, that's generated from those data. You can do content analysis and we have these kind of ways that you can code information so that you're looking at the um, like content that organizations produce in a systematic way watching commercials or news programs and we'll look at how much space is given to particular topics, textbooks, textbooks are cultural artifacts and so you can analyze the textbooks for um, not just what's there but what isn't there and, and um, how dissemination of information, the construction of knowledge is packaged and so what, what do we learn from the packaging of that information. Sociologists are everywhere and they're using sociological perspectives in the work that they do in every day and that could include business, it could include marketing, it could include social work, um, it could include people who are doing number crunching for either hospitals or for government agencies. Um, and basically the skills we teach are things that are practical in a, lot, a variety of places. Um, my specialty is medical sociology, which doesn't seem to really go together, right? Um, but what I have been working on for the last few years, along with my students and with other colleagues, is looking at hospital data from our region in about 15 counties and seeing what the trends are. Things like disease are not just physical, they occur in a social context and people's behavior is affected by that social context which may or may not contribute to a disease pattern for example. And my most recent project is looking at red tide events and how that has affected uh, respiratory uh, hospitalizations. So in a hospital or in a community setting you may have people who are sociologists who don't necessarily wear that title but they're doing sociology. So even MD Anderson which is a world-renowned cancer center has added a whole behavioral science wing and that includes sociologists working there. So a new thing that we're working on has to do with resilience, community resilience after let's say something like a hurricane. We're just now in the beginning stages of looking at um, how do people recover and which communities recover quicker than others after a major natural disaster. And so at the table on that conversation are psychologists, sociologists, and people who are environmental scientists who deal with, you know, um, weather patterns and such. And so it's very exciting that, again, sociology, you, would, you wouldn't think a sociologist would have anything to contribute to other areas, especially physical scientists, but we do. So sociology is, um, is relevant in almost every um, and human endeavor, including the practice of science itself. We, for example, have a subfield, the sociology of science, which looks at the uh, patterns of interactions uh, that develop among uh, collaborating scientists and why certain kinds of uh, scientific topics tend to be more relevant in certain kinds of societies and deserving of uh, intense academic or research pursuits than others. So uh, whether or not you're a physicist, you're a scientist, you're a biology major, there is some sociology in whatever you are doing.
even if you are a math major. We, for example, are interested in why there are gender differences in, the, uh, in, in people's interest in mathematics, why men tend to be more likely to major in math than women. And so, really, it's just about developing these skills that are very much desirable in the broader community. I mean, whether if you're working for government, people want to assess right their operations, what's happening, how people perceive you know the services that they're receiving. If you look at the education system, they've got standardized tests. They're doing analysis in terms of students' attendance, right, um, pass rates, um, truancy issues mastery of content. Um, so if you, I mean, if you look at within the various sectors, I mean, even the private sectors, they want to evaluate um, the effectiveness of their operations, right? So what are their goals in terms of their business? Are they meeting their goals? Are there gaps? What can they do better? I mean, all of that kind of leads you in the direction of evidence-based decision-making processes. Sociology prepares students for a range of careers and, and occupations and professions. Um, there's been recent national surveys of sociology graduates and number one they do uh, suggest that they use a lot of their sociology coursework um, in their day-to-day -day lives uh, on the job. We have former students who are lawyers, we have some that work for um, universities where they do institutional research to find out what the trends are for their particular students. We have some that work with the Census Bureau. Um, we have some that work in social services, many who with just a bachelor's degree do go on to work for social services and helping them to, um, to deal with everyday problems in their lives and how to make that better for them. There are some who, are, who have been employed by multinational corporations to do marketing research. Who buys what, where, when, how, and with whom? Those are job opportunities that sociologists tend to fail. I also like to think about sociology as a people science. If you're curious about the world, you might make a good sociologist. If, you, if you're a people watcher, I think that that makes you a good sociologist. Or if you ever just ask, if you're ever curious about why the world exists the way that it does, or why people do the things that they do. Um, those are inherently good sociological questions. Uh, my first sociology professor, uh, the irony of history, was an American Catholic priest. He made sociology so interesting, specifically by making it a discipline that queried, taking for granted knowledge. He did not leave any space that you could not ask questions and very invasive and sometimes subversive questions. Yeah. I like irreverent questions, questions that will shake people's belief and then you know we can talk about how do we best answer these questions using evidence, empirical evidence, not just you know folk tales.